So we had a number of questions that were submitted in advance. So what I'll do, I'll read through the question and um, then I'll ask perhaps Stephen Phillips um, for his thoughts on it and then over to Kenny and Steve for Oscar's view. So uh, first question, um, a factory which is singularly the largest employer in the community directly employing approximately 9% of the working population and a further 6% indirectly. The factory injects approximately £1.6 million directly into the local economy. The factory is structured as an industrial and provident society with a majority of its shareholders being members of the local community. Can the local development trust, as a registered Scottish charity, financially support the factory with a grant to increase efficiency, increase production, and retain local employment? So I'll hand over to Stephen Phillips. Stephen, if you've got any thoughts on that, thanks. Yeah, I mean, this fits absolutely in the zone of, uh, in the amber zone, if you like, um, and uh, it's undoubtedly the kind of issue which does um, you know, raise challenges. I suppose I, I would say um, that if you if the same question had been asked perhaps five years ago, um, I think we'd have said, kind of don't go there. And there is a kind of strand within uh, charity law and practice which has tended to the view that um, when we uh, that basically and uh, that, that that charity should not help businesses in in, in blunt terms, and certainly it's the case that increasing the profitability of a business, um, you know, is, is, is very much a kind of no-go area for, 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 for charities, for very obvious reasons. The bit which I think can, however, put a slightly different slant on this kind of proposition is looking at the community development charitable head and looking at the urban or rural regeneration charitable head. And it is to say that if you had an employer whose survival was critical or the economic well-being of a community which was seriously challenged, i.e. it was economically fragile, then there could be circumstances where it might be permissible to provide um, finance to ensure the survival of that business. Um, equally, if there um, were significant problems of unemployment within the area and there was some form of financial support coming out from the charity which was clearly earmarked towards training and work experience opportunities for local people um, with the amount being paid commensurate with the benefit in terms of, of advancing a relief of unemployment charitable purpose, um, then again that might get into the permissible own. There isn't, however, a kind of straightforward answer to that, and I think we're going to be back to Steve Kent's um, mantra, which is, quote, that will be a matter for the charity trustees. Um, it is a matter of balance. I think what we can say, and I'm sure um, you know, Kenny and Steve would, would, would confirm, is lay out the tests which the charity trustees should be applying in determining whether or not this is something um, which they feel the public benefit in relation to this is, you know, clearly outweighing the private benefit to those that operate the factory, um, that they have charitable purposes such as, you know, urban regeneration, rural regeneration, community development, relief of unemployment, relief of poverty, those sorts of charitable purposes which this can readily be seen to um, further and that the amount that the charity is paid out is carefully nuanced or balanced to ensure that no more private benefit is being delivered than that is than that than is needed to unlock that charitable benefit. Um, the fact that in this particular case the majority of the shareholders um, are members of the local community, to my mind, is not particularly relevant. The fact that it's structured an industrial provident society, ditto. Um, you know, again, it's not clear what type of industrial provident society, incidentally, now called registered societies master terminology, whether it's a society that benefits the community or a, a, a co-op. If it's a co-op, then it benefits members and actually, you know, the, one couldn't draw any distinction. If it's a BENCOM, you might get some comfort from the fact that um, the entity that you're giving support to itself is geared towards community benefit. But these are 
ancillary issues compared with the, 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 the charter law principles that we've outlined there. And the kind of final point would be that in addition to considering this by reference to uh, Scottish charter law and the principles that, that, that um, uh, Steve and Kenny have been, have been mentioning, one does need to have regard to the risk or potential risk that HMRC charities um, applying principles of uh, charity law of England and Wales might take a, def a, a, a different view of life, and if it was a substantial payment, then that would be quite a significant worry. We've had a question into the box. Okay. We've had a question into the question box linked to that, um, which is: Do harbour trusts come under businesses? Should they be considered a community group slash public sector body? That's standard Kenzie and Alton. <laughs> It's an interesting one. In the context of support to a harbour trust, the kind of issue is not so much um, whether the harbour trust as an entity, um, you know, itself has charitable status or, um, you know, is operating as what might be regarded as a kind of commercial basis. Um, it's more about the 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 the, the matter that you're the, the, that you're actually giving support to. Um, and that ties in with the idea that if a harbour is um, a, a essentially a kind of public facility um, and operated on that basis, then the, 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 the taste is whether or not um, the uh, support of public facility of that kind falls within the charitable purposes um, of, the, of the charity that's giving the money and whether the terms and conditions that you're attaching to the funding again tie this down sufficiently to ensure that where the money is spent is again sitting within the boundaries of charitable status. The fact that Harbour Trust exists to preserve and promote the, the harbour for all time coming and so on is, 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 is in the sense that it um, reduces, I suppose, the concerns that um, you're providing private benefit in the sense of dividends to shareholders, but it isn't the, the start and finish of it. Um, to my mind, the kind of key question is, first of all, does the support of, an, of a harbour fall within the charitable purposes of the charity? And secondly, is it clear that the money is earmarked for particular projects that clearly deliver um, public benefit um, in so doing? So again, a distinction potentially there between a harbour in the sense of maintaining infrastructure for local fishermen that's critical to the economy of that local community as distinct from a harbour which is operating more of a kind of yacht marina for um, you know, um, you know well-heeled people to come in with their yachts. Even on that second basis though, um, in a slightly more difficult way, I suppose one could perhaps argue that if um, you know, providing um, a place where you know, yachts can come in could be really important in for a kind of fragile economy that's surviving heavily or, or that's heavily dependent on tourism. So again, it's not an <coughs> um either. Sorry, a lot of these questions are absolutely sitting in the fringes. There isn't a straightforward yes or no answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for that, Stephen. I wonder perhaps if we could pass over to Kenny and Steve then to come back to the, the first question um, about um, a grant to um, a factory um, and if I could summarise, hopefully, um, what Stephen Phillips said, it, it is all around demonstrating the economic fragility of an area, um, to demonstrate that the grant is not aimed at increasing um, profitability of the business and that the grant level is proportionate to the demonstrable public benefit. Um, so I wonder if, if Stephen Kenny from Oscar, if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Um, I, well, I think, um, first off, we would... Um I don't think there's anything that Stephen said that we would disagree with. Uh, I mean, Stephen, Stephen began by referring to um, uh, you know, thinking that this would be um, almost certainly an, an amber light activity in terms of the uh, the, the DTAS toolkit, um, and absolutely it is. I mean, there's some um, you know, got just reading from the toolkit here. One of the, um, uh, the 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 bullet points in there, which clearly gets an amber light, is. Um, ongoing operation or ongoing financial support needed to sustain viability of businesses which are essential to sustain a fragile local economy and or provide essential local services and it gives examples of post offices, village shops, uh, food processing facilities, quarries, abattoirs, uh, etc. 
Um, so I mean, it's it, you know, it's it's actually quite gratifying to to hear Stephen say that you know this is not a straightforward um, question. And I think when we when we you know Kenny and I first had sight of it. But we, we thought exactly the same. You know, on, the, on the surface of it, you hear words like factory and, and increased efficiency in production, and we, and we wince. But then, when we, we we stop and look at it a bit, you know, in a bit more detail, we think, well, actually, there's there's a lot more context I think which would be needed here to um, you know, to, to, uh, to 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 really give a, a kind of an informed opinion on this. Um, uh, you know, absolutely anything which is about increasing the profitability of a business um, directly, I think, would be a, a, a kind of no-go area. So think, things like um, increasing efficiency and increasing production, uh, you know, I would see very much as being linked to increasing profitability. Uh, on the other hand, the the, um, the issue about retaining uh, local employment is... is um, you know, particularly in an area where you know this is the the um, there is a, a high unemployment or a risk of unemployment, particularly if businesses fail, then um, you know clearly this is an area where you know potentially there could be public benefit in furtherance of a charitable purpose. I mean, Kenny said in one of his slides earlier on that, um, but somewhat paradoxically, in in some ways, you know, the creation of jobs in itself is not seen as an activity uh, necessarily that relieves unemployment. And uh, you know, certainly we've taken the view in the past here that um, employing people simply for the, for the purposes of carrying on a trade is not relief of unemployment in a charitable sense because uh, relief of unemployment has to be uh, more general than that and it has to be about sort of addressing the, uh, the kind of structural um, issues, if you like, which, which are kind of underpinning that, that, that um, unemployment in an area. Um, so creation of jobs in itself is not necessarily an effective way of, of um, relieving unemployment. But we, we, you know, we do recognize that you know, the businesses that are able to take people on work placements, that are providing work experience, that are providing apprenticeships, that are providing um, training, particularly those that are um, geared at you know, those parts of the community that are likely to face barriers to employment, um, you know, for, for, for whatever reasons, uh, you know, pe pe people who are at risk of, of long-term unemployment for one, one reason or another, then I think you know, you know, it's clearly possible that uh, private sector businesses in those circumstances do have a part to play in the regeneration of, uh, of, um, of local economies. I mean, I think uh, you know, I mean, Stephen, Stephen made the point about the. Um, you know the fact that this is a, a registered society with with and and the shareholders live locally. You know, not again. I mean, I think we would agree that that's not really necessarily an issue for us. Although it could be. You know, it, I mean, I think we'd need to know more about. Um, you know, whether or not, in fact, in, you know, either constitutionally or in practice, there were dividend payments being made to shareholders. So, so you know, whether there was private benefit from profitability in, in that sense. Um, it, it also isn't clear from us from the question whether this is, you know, intended as a as a kind of one-off grant, whether it's sort of capital for investment in in sort of um, you know, upgrading equipment, or whether or whether this is um, a sort of recurring expenditure, which is um, deemed you know de intended to, um, to sort of subsidise operating losses of this particular company, which just seems to us to be a bit of a, a black hole that you'd be pouring money into um, each year. Um, so, um, you know, if this is just about ensuring the survival of this business, as I, which I think was the, the phrase that Stephen used, or whether this is actually about developing, you know, developing the business, taking it to a next step, if you like, to enable it to offer a greater range of employment opportunities. Um, I think, you know, we, we would need to know a lot more of the, the kind of context of that really before we could, um, you know, really give an informed answer. And, and I think this is where, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, the, the difficulties of us providing bespoke um, uh, advice in these circumstances. Um, you, quite, quite often when, when charities approach us with these kind of questions, we, we don't have access to all of the material facts and the local context here. And this is why it's absolutely essential that they're, you know, they're able to, to speak to their professional advisors and give them the full picture, if you like, because it's, it's that context which means, you know, which makes all of the difference in these circumstances. Yeah. No, 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 I'll just 
quickly add to that, yeah, the first question I wrote down beside this was, was why do they want to support the local factory? Is it because it's in financial difficulty? Or is it because it's going to create more jobs or, sorry, or more training opportunities? So, again, the why is actually quite critical here as well, you know. So, yeah, a difficult one. It's, it's, it's not a definite no, um, but there would need to be certain criteria that would be met before they could definitely do it. Great. Thanks, Kenny and Steve. That's really helpful. The, the second question sort of links to that, and I think we may have answered it with the harbours issue. Um, so applying the same um, question to other businesses with the, within the community, so not an industrial and provident society, so a business with shareholders and um, directors, I think what you're saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong, again, um, they would have to demonstrate um, that the, the area is economically fragile um, and provide quite a lot of information on that um, and that it's, it's not, this, this grant or loan is not aimed at increasing the profitability of the business, um, but it has a much broader public benefit. Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think... Um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, it's up to the charity trustees suitably advised to, uh, to 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 make the case, if you like, and um, and you know, and, and if called upon to do so by by us or, or, or others to to you know to be able to sort of demonstrate, if you like, the, the reasoning and the thought process they they've gone through to uh, you know to justify that this is this is a legitimate use of charitable funding. Yeah, the the, the me also, I, I don't know, am I audible? Yes, yes. 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 Ah, <laughs> uh, I, I suppose there may also be an angle that relates to the nature of the business activity itself. So, you know, if it, if it um, is operating a harbour, if it's operating a local shop, a local post office, or something which is, you know, ha has another dimension which makes it critical for the community, yes. then yeah. um, that is a, a, another factor that can be taken into account as distinct from, if you like, a random business where the issues would be more about um, unemployment and, and, and I suppose to some extent the stability of the community in terms of um, having, you know, as a key employer, um, having people working there means also that they're living there, which in turn means that the local school remains viable, the local shop remains viable and so on and so forth. But for most, but, you know, the, 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 I suppose to say that um, you know, each business will have a degree of impact of that kind. There will be certain types of business activity where slightly different principles can come into play, one of which may be, you know, some strands of charity law around the provision of kind of um, infrastructure such as a harbour, um, and the other may be around the idea that not having a village shop, not having a village pub, arguably, um, you know, and so on, ha has you know, wider and, and, and potentially more significant impacts that could be relevant factors, not, you know, absolutely can do it, but nevertheless are factors which could validly be taken into account. Thanks, Stephen. I think the next question we've got sort of closely links into that. Um, a small child minding service, the only provision available in the community, wants to apply for a small grant to fence off an outside area and purchase some new play equipment, um, improving the service and enabling um, them to take on more children. Um, there's a, a benefit to the community in that more parents are enabled to return to employment employment, um, but is that sort of service, um, a child minding service run privately, um, would we be able to demonstrate, as with a post office or shop or pub, sort of the potential sort of lifeline service retention in a very fragile community? Um, perhaps if I could ask Stephen Phillips that first and get his thoughts. <laughs> I get landed with a, with a first shot at each of these. <laughs> Oh, we'll try Kenny next and Steve. <laughs> I don't know if, if, if that was the issue that Steve and Kenny had to uh, correct me and say it was, it was off in the wrong, wrong time. I think it is very much, this one is, is very much in the same kind of zone. Um, I suppose, you know, for some time I have been working for a number of um, more than urban context um, bodies looking towards, you know, relieving unemployment and, you know, clearly a barrier to re-entering employment um, for, for uh, for many people or for sustaining employment is um, the issue of childcare and I suppose therefore even if you're looking at a child minding service where the owner of that business if you like is running that um, you know as their own kind of livelihood the angle on this is looking at the, op the um, 
of the, the, the op options that are available within the relevant catchment area um, for uh, addressing child care issues. Um, looking, I suppose, focusing then, I suppose, on this one, which is the only provision available, and seeing whether or not by providing um, some additional funding, you're confident that the outcome of that will be its ability to take on more children, particularly for people who are returning to employment. So you'd essentially be hanging it, I think, primarily on the um, relief of unemployment strand in this particular context. So um, it may be that um, if, if, if that was a charitable purpose you were using, you would want to ensure that the additional places made available were, uh, in fact, um, it, you know, earmarked, if you like, for people who were using them for that purpose, rather than um, people who were, you know, you know, wanting some child care support, but for purposes unrelated to um, employment. Um, there is other. There's also a kind of um, a, a child care a strand which relates to promotion of education, which can be uh, relevant in the context of whether um, charitable support can be that relevant. So, to my mind, the key point would be, you know, is the charity convinced that um, you know this is the only provision available? First of all, and and. And, and, and that by um, expending the charity funds in this way, that the outcome in terms of um, parents being able to employment is, is real and will happen, and therefore tying that into the uh, conditions of funding accordingly. Great, thanks, Stephen. Um, Kenny, Steve, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, yeah. Don't disagree with anything there at all. Um, I think this one. Um, <laughs> It's so difficult, you know, based on a paragraph, because you don't really know the, you know, the, the circumstances, and that's really what it boils down to. But, you know, it's 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 a balancing act. You you need to look at the the, the private benefit yet to the employer compared to the, you know, the, the public benefit and which charitable purposes and furtherance of, you know, based on the small amount of information we've got here, the the private benefit is quite clear and defined. You know, she gets an area fenced off, gets good play equipment, uh, services improved, and she gets more children you know, in, in, into the provision. Um, public benefit here, based on what we've got, isn't quite so clear. Um, enabling more parents to return to unemployment, sorry, to return to employment seems to be the, you know, the, the public benefit. Well, again, it's, it's, it's quite loose that, it's, you know, the relief of unemployment activities would need to be targeted towards people who are unemployed. It's not clear from that 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 is the case. You know, we also need to look at things like is the provision currently full, for example, you know, does it need to be extended, you know, so we kind of look at, you know, what, what the, the motivating factors behind it were. Um, Steve, anything? Uh, no, no, I think no, I, th I, th I would agree with that. I mean, I think, um, you know, as, as, as Stephen said, you know, I mean, it's um, uh, you know, clearly, you know, things which are about removing barriers to um, uh, employment or, or or for that matter removing barriers to uh, education or you know enabling people to sort of take up health provision you know those kind of things by um, by providing um, sort of child minding or creche facilities or, or whatever uh, um, and, and you know and, and I guess you know, uh, often this will be particularly targeted at, uh, at women who are bearing the, you know the um, the, the um, most of the, uh, the the sort of burden of, of childcare responsibilities, then I mean you know, certainly there are you know many charitable activities which are um, providing those kind of facilities to enable people to return to you know sort of training for work for example or you know to participate in in sort of health clinics and all, all of those kind of things. So that you know potentially there are a number of charitable purposes other than just the employment one here which which could be relevant. Uh, but um, you know, as Kenny said, we we need to know more about the context here, about the um, you know whether in, indeed there is any other provision locally, or whether it was in fact feasible to to, to start provision, whether the existing provision is full. It's also not entirely how um, you know, just pushing new play equipment off an area which would necessarily increase capacity in terms of the number of children that could be taken on here, because you know, it might also 
Um, I'll put to you, Kenny and Steve first. Um, the Trust offers an education and training grant open to members of the community. The fund covers 50% of course fees to a maximum of £500 in any one year. Some of the applications are related to a person's place of work, such as food hygiene, first aid at work, refrigeration engineer courses, etc. Um, therefore, these grants do benefit the business as well as the individual. Um, what are your thoughts on that sort of grant scheme? Um. Well, clearly, uh, many uh, charities do support uh, individuals with um, uh, participating in education and uh, and obtaining uh, qualifications, or, or um, you know, some of people can be used for them in terms of, of obtaining and obtaining employment. Uh, so there's, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with, with that at all. Many of the charities are providing sort of bursaries and grant schemes in, in, in those kind of circumstances here. Now, looking at the example given there, if you had a, a college, for example, that was doing um, courses around food hygiene or first aid, and you know, they would sort of open to applicants and people participating in those courses and, and, um, and, and receiving some sort of certification or qualification at the end of that, then, um, you know, and, and that then in turn, in turn helped their, their sort of employability, if you like, if it was, you know, um, then I, you know, I don't think we would have any difficulty with that at all. Uh, where, where it becomes more problematic, I think, is where you have got um, sort of existing employees in a workplace where it is a requirement of that workplace that they have been trained to a certain standard in order to, uh, to carry on that, that work. Um, and particularly where that's an activity that might perhaps um, to date have been funded by the employer. Um, and you know, where you could perhaps identify that the employer was... Um, uh, sort of reducing its its overheads, if you like, by expecting employees to fund their own uh, sort of on the job training going forward. If you think there, and and, and I think that, you know if, if that's related to um, reducing overheads, to increasing the profitability of that business, then clearly there's a private benefit dimension to that, which we would expect the trust to take into consideration in, in these circumstances. Um, in, in some ways, a bit like the um, the paradox of the um, you know, the creating jobs. Um, you also tend to take you, um, simply providing somebody you know, who is in work with on-the-job training to, to enable them to do the job for which they are employed uh, isn't advancing education in a charitable sense unless it's um, providing a, an apprenticeship scheme or, or, or a work placement scheme for um, people who are, you know, who, are, who are perhaps there on a temporary basis and, and, um, you know, and it's improving their employability in a more general sense. Uh, you know, but, if, but if I go to work in a supermarket, for example, and a, and a supermarket shows me how the till works and, and, and how, all, how all the stock control mechanisms work and so forth, then that is simply um, uh, training that I need in order to carry on the trade of my employer. So it's not education in a sense that we even consider charitable. But, you know, the kind of examples that are given here, first aid, food hygiene, yeah, I mean, some, some of those may be um, sort of essential for a, for, for a job, but, um, you know, I, I think you could equally make a case to say that these would be uh, transferable skills that people could take to other workplaces with them. So um, I, I think generally, you know, we, we, we feel more relaxed about this one than yeah. perhaps we have done yeah. with the, uh, the um, you know, the, the previous questions. Great, thanks, Kenny. Steve, Stephen, is there anything you want to add to that? Well, I, mean, I, I obviously would endorse all, all of that stuff. I suppose there may be another little strand, which is that the um, if <laughs> I suppose that the, the training is essential to sustain somebody in employment. You know, in other words, they wouldn't be kept on unless 
you know, that they, they increase their qualifications, then there might be an angle in this round, um, you know, the general principles around, you know, people being able to sustain themselves in employment. Um, it, you know, if that was relevant to anything particularly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Moving on, it's sort of linked to some of the early questions, but this is a bit more around loans um, and that a trust has developed a business loans facility uh, to improve existing services and create new opportunities in the community. And I know you're going to want more context as to what they are, but I think the general issue around loans, um, can trusts give loans? On what um, conditions can they give loans? If they give them at the prevailing market interest rate, um, can they give loans to anybody or is it, again, only within their purpose? Um, and if they give loans at below market interest rates, what are the issues there? So quite a lot of things to think about there. So perhaps if I could ask Kenny and Steve first. Business loans facility, existing service, opportunities in the community. Yeah, I mean there's, there's, nothing, um, there's nothing in charity law that prevents charities from uh, make, making loans. Um, it, I think we need to be you know, the trustees would need to be satisfied that it's within the uh, the, the powers they, they have within their governing documents to to do so. Um, it, you know, there's nothing to prevent charities making loans that are in furtherance of their charitable purposes, as as you say. I mean, if if certainly if they are um, uh, if they are making loans that are at at no or at low um, interest rates, interest rates that are below kind of market levels, then we would clearly expect those to be. Uh, loans that were in furtherance of the charity's purposes. Um, if, if they're if they're charging um, sort of commercial rates of interest for loans, then you know um, I think that the, you know, the factor there becomes less about whether it's relevant to the purposes and more one of risk, really, and whether or not it's in the interests of the charity to do so. I mean, if you know if, if a charity is making investments, uh, you know, if, in that sense, if it's making it some, um, you know, it, it's its capital in making its reserves that it has available work hard for it, if you like, um, but without subjecting those to, to sort of an undue level of risk, then, you know, then, then um, you know, potentially charities could make loans that were, were, were not directly in furtherance of their purposes if they were a way of, you know, of generating income. But I, I, I suspect that the, um, the, the, the question here is more about um, loans which are in furtherance of the of, of, um, of the purposes, as it were. Um, if and, and in, in that sense, the same rules would apply as in as in the case of making grants. Really, you know, the trustees would would, would have to make a case for uh, for saying that you know this this is this is clearly in furtherance of the purposes. Um, there would be a lot, you know, clearly questions in here about care and diligence in the way. In which that, um, that that loan was arranged, what the repayment terms on the loan were, whether it was a secured or an unsecured loan, um, you know, what would happen in terms of a, a default in any way on, on repayment or, or, of that loan. So, um, I mean, it, it's clearly an area, I think, where we would, um, you know, expect trustees to be taking uh, sort of suitable professional advice. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Anything to add? Yeah, I suppose it's just to kind of put a historical slant in this, um, there was a time when um, I think both in terms of what the Charity Commission was saying and, and, and what was happening up here in Scotland, um, a preference, you know, for a loan to be kind of one thing or the other, that it either had to be, you know, within the category of investment and therefore a sound investment um, for a charity proper um, market rate of interest, proper security, appraisal of this as distinct, you know, as compared with other investment opportunities, is this a safe and, and, and sound way to deal with the charity's money? So that was one model. Or on the other hand, is it really, um, you know, sitting um, fairly and squarely in the charity zone as if, you know, we could actually give this money out as a, as a, as a grant, as a non, in non repayable form, but let's do it as a soft loan with a, a, a nominal rate of interest and, and, and you know, the, the kind of sense that it's got to be one or other. Um, uh, the Charity Commission has, has issued, you know, I think interesting guidance, not, uh, and it's actually some, some time back, around kind of what's what they regard as mixed motive investment, where there is an element of re financial return coming in, so it's quite good for the charity from that point of view, um, but equally it also furthers a charitable purpose. 
So you're kind of saying, well, do you know what we're giving up here in terms of the rate of interest? We're not, you know, if you like, throwing it away. We're getting less interest than we would get um, if we were taking a completely hard-nosed approach on it. But if you look at the benefit that we're unlocking, you know, at that rate of interest, that is commensurate with the charitable purpose that we are pursuing, which is a slightly more subtle approach that you're not looking at the capital amount of the loan that you're paying out. You're looking at the, if you like, the disbenefit to the charity. What you know, what the charity is giving up in terms of rate of interest um, in, in furtherance of a charitable purpose, and that uh, and that's a, 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 certainly a more complex analysis. The risk bit would still need to be factored in because that would need to be predicated on the idea that the, the money, the capital, was was reasonably secure. So mixed motive investment, program related loans, and other. Um, bit of jargon around all of this, and certainly it's the kind of thing that, particularly with renewables money, that um, organisations of charitable status are looking at more and more. And it is tying in with the stuff that we've been talking about earlier. If um, there isn't a charitable purpose being furthered of the kind that we've been exploring around the fact of in child mining stuff and so on and so forth, then um, you're in really sticky ground unless you can justify it as a sound investment. And actually, um, you know, lending money to local businesses is generally not the most prudent way for a charity to lend its money in the normal course. Great, thank you for that. Um, I've just got one more question, which actually I'm, I'm not sure we're going to be able to cover here because I think it's specifically about um, tax and trading subsidiaries. Um, there's been some recent changes to the tax guidance for trading subsidiaries and what they can donate to their parent companies. Um, and I'll, can anyone advise on the implications um, for development trusts with trading subsidiaries? Um, I don't know, Kenny and Steve, if there's anything you'd want to say there or point people in the right direction. Um, no, I, I think really, as you're saying, this is a question for HMRC, but I, I, I am, um, we, we've noticed that some, uh, uh, the Charity Commission has just recently re-updated, um, as from February uh, 2016, its guidance um, that it's prepared jointly with HMRC on, on charities trading and tax, how charities may, may lawfully trade. Uh, the, the, the section in there about um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the payments from subsidiaries back to the parent charity has been updated. So um, it's probably best not for us not to say more than that, but just re you know, refer anyone who's interested to, to that particular guidance. Uh, and that, uh, incidentally, we, we also had another question um, on our list here, which was about the statutory threshold for income from the hiring out of rooms if it's, um, if it's a non-charitable trade. Uh, that, that guidance also addresses that question too about the um, small-scale exemptions from corporate tax for um, incoming resources from uh, non-primary purpose uh, trading during a chargeable period. So both of those questions are, are covered in that guidance and that, that would probably be the best source of advice. Great, thank you. Uh, if I can just come in here briefly also just to say that um, DTA is called members. Members. Oh, sorry, Rory, we're having a real difficulty with your connection, there. Eh? We have an yeah. Scotland Creef um, uh, accountants, so, so DTAS members will be able to get advice on that type of tax issue um, through, through the sort of free advice service um, from that. So get in touch with us um, if, if it's more specifically tax to charity, and we might be able to help uh, through, through that particular service. Okay, Roy, I just wonder, would you on the question panel on the side, will you just write that down so people can take that information down from you about who the accountants are and to get in touch with you? Okay. Uh, I can circulate Thanks. that as a brief after the webinar. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in from the question box, um, one of which is community... Great, okay, do you want to fire away with those? Yep. A community survey showed a number one priority across all age groups was a community cafe. If this was operated as a commercial enterprise, could a development trust provide grant support? 
That's from Alistair Waddle. I'm not sure which panel is. Uh, Stephen, do you want to go first? Yes, yeah. um, Stephen, put it. <laughs> okay, I hesitate to come in because so far uh, <laughs> I, I have uh, Steve and Kenny and <laughs> I have, have been in agreement with what I'm saying, so I don't want to go too far on a limb. I suppose what <laughs> we can start off start off by saying that the you know that 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 traditionally a cafe is a cafe. It needs you know it's handing over over cups of coffee and and cake or something healthier, um, and you know on the face of it, unless it is part of a wider community facility. Um, so classically, cafe within a museum, which you, which you know, is part of the, the if you like the museum experience, but primarily facing into the museum rather than facing onto the public road. So it's for users of the museum. Unless it falls into that kind of a category, then um, you know the kind of default, if you like, is that it's 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 a business. Having said that, and again tying in with you know the, some of the other themes that have come through here, if the cafe is contributing in a wider way to the well-being of the local community, then a case might be made, I suppose, that a degree of grant support, um, you know, a measured degree, you know, a, which proportionate to the um, benefit in terms of further and surcharge projects might be um, permissible. But it's undoubtedly um, tricky, tricky territory. A lot would depend on the kind of wider plans around the cafe. A cafe as cafe? No. A cafe which, you know, had a kind of whole um, outreach aspect to it in terms of bringing in, let's say, you know, a, older people within the community, people with disabilities, or actually holding a kind of range of um, events that they could participate in that possibly was a forum for, um, you know, the local um, health professionals to spread messages about healthy eating, um, potentially which, you know, had a regular series of arts activities going on. All of those sorts of factors could be rolled in, I think, to support, um, you know, a, a, some degree of funding support um, from, from, from a charity. Um, but um, again, I think we're back in the territory saying, well, you know, it would be for the board, the charity, to weigh up those aspects in terms of charitable purposes and furtherance of public benefit against, you know, what would be seen as private benefit in terms of, um, you know, supporting the viability of what was essentially a business proposition. Thanks, Stephen. Sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, <laughs> Kenny and Steve, any anything to add to that? No, that, that's absolutely the sort of thing we would have said there as well. I mean, a cafe in itself, there's an awful lot of this going on there with community cafes, and I suppose it depends what they wanted to fund it for. You know, just to set up the business might be oh, tricky, but if the cafe, let's just say they were funding it to do the outreach facilities, for example, in particular, you know, to get more sort of people who are socially isolated in, then that, that potentially could be in furtherance of their purposes. So. I guess it comes back to again: is, is, is would the funding be directly in furtherance of their purposes? Depends what they wanted to fund at the cafe for. Um, so it, it's possible. It's possible that they could do that, and, and it could be in furtherance of their purpose, but not generally just to throw money at a, you know a potential cafe, if you like. Uh, I think also we, I mean, we, um, you know, we, we get many, many um, applications come in here that, that um, have, have some sort of wider community purposes to them that have a a, um, a cafe um, sort of thrown into the application, if you like, and, and um, you know that's that's often um, or, or um, the aspiration is that that will be an income generating activity. But um, you know, certainly, you know, most of the advice we've seen is that there are very, very few. Uh, cafes that actually make any money, frankly. So if it's just being included in a in a in a um, you know in an application for charitable status as part of a kind of wider community hub, if you like, then the uh, you know, the, the cafe may well be a, a a draw, or it may well be a resource, as as Stephen said, which is used for other things, like you know as a, as a base for giving out. Um, you know, anything from health advice, debt counselling, as a, as a, a venue for sort of display of artworks, you know, those kind of things. But but um, a cafe as a means of generating income for um, uh, you know sort of, uh, you know a kind of social enterprise, if you like, for for other uh, which will you know then be be used for other purposes. 
um, we, we we tend to find on the whole that um, you know, you know they, they they don't really make much money really. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Ailey, we've got another question. Yes, under the prevention or or relief of poverty objective, what is the opinion on setting up a hardship fund that people or families could apply to for critical circumstances, assuming that detailed criteria would be set out by the trust? Okay, so pass that to Kenny and Steve first. Yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 that sounds relatively uncontroversial, you know, to, to have a hardship fund, as long as, you know, they're, they've got their own criteria and, and, and the awards, the awards are, it's clear and transparent how they make decisions as to who should get the awards. Um, that, that actually sounds relatively straightforward to me. Okay, yeah, thank you, Steve. Green zone. <laughs> green zone, fantastic. Oh, I'll good, our first green I'll zone. I'll add one more thing, green zone. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think I think you know, the only, you know, as Kenny said, really, the only qualifying thing really is that if it's re if it's relief of poverty or re you know relief of those who need through financial hardship, then the um, you know they really need to be able to demonstrate that they have some criteria for ensuring that it's targeted at uh, at the right people. You know, so it's targeted at people who are genuinely um, um, in financial difficulty or who are or who are at risk of of poverty in some way. Um, so you know, just um, you know, and the same would apply to things like food banks and clothing banks, and you know, anything really which is um, targeted at, 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 um, at people who are in financial difficulty. There, there must be some way of, of sort of um, you know, sort of discerning or, or, or discriminating uh, in, in favour of those people who are in need. Okay, thank you for that, Ailey. Do we have any other written questions? We have three more questions. Uh, the first of that is, okay, carry away. can a charity grant money for a purpose it recognises will not pass the charity test, but is nonetheless important for its own community development purposes and approved of by its community without risking its charitable status and accepting it will have to pay corporation tax on that grant? Um. I think this is one for Oscar, definitely. <laughs> Just repeat that question because the first bit sounded quite frightening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay, um, so can a charity grant money for the purpose it recognises it will not pass a charity test when they recognise? Uh, no. no. <laughs> I think I think yeah. the answer to that yeah. is no. Yeah. If, it, if it's if it's if it's granting money for a purpose which is not a charitable purpose, um, then. Uh, no, unless it was a sound investment, for example, you know, or something uh -huh. like that, you know, but, but, but generally, no. If it's making a grant, then that's... Um, yeah, it's not an investment. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, no. it, you know, what it's running counter to is the principle that the charity trustees have a duty under the legislation to ensure that the charity acts in accordance with its charitable purposes. Absolutely. Um, if they're granting money, there can't be an investment angle to it by definition, and they're basically the charity is paying out money, clearly not in further charitable purposes. It's a slightly odd one, I suppose, because, um, uh, you know, a question in, in a real life situation may be, well, you know, um, I, would it never fall under any of the charitable purposes in the legislation, or might there be scope for um, applying to Oscar for consent to an adjustment to the um, object clause within the charity's constitution to enable this to happen? Um, or, you know, is it sitting as a, in, a, in a zone where, um, you know, it's just a no-go from, from the point of view of charity boundaries at all? If it's sitting in a, in a, in a no-zone, there's no charitable purpose anywhere that could possibly cover it, then absolutely, you know, absolutely not. Uh, I don't, I, I, and, you know, I, I'm leaving aside the tax issue, um, you know, I, I don't think anybody could recommend that a, a charity, you know, uh, breaches, uh, you know, a charity just is breached their duties and such. A, Okay, so hopefully that's fairly clear. Um, thanks, Ailey. Next question. Uh, to what extent can charity focus its activities? For example, can it not fund any applications within one of its charitable purposes? That's from Carola Bell. Um, well, uh, I'm assuming that the, the, in the context of this question is that uh, this is a, a charity that perhaps has a number of charitable purposes, and, and um, it, 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 I mean, it, it, 
it isn't necessary for a, a charity to be demonstrating activities in furtherance of all of its charitable purposes all of the time. Um, you know, certain, certainly um, development trusts, you know, um, you know, they, 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 they may have quite a broad suite of purposes, in fact, in, in, their, in their governing documents. Um, and you know, we wouldn't necessarily be expecting them to be um, sort of demonstrable sort of projects or activities that further all of those purposes all of the time. Um, however, if they have purposes in their constitution that they are in effect never um, 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 advancing in any way, then it kind of begs the question why they've got those purposes in the first place, really. Um, and you know they, uh, you know they might actually wish to sort of apply to for consent to us to um, to, to sort of simplify or, or, or to reduce the, the number of purposes they have. Um, is that uh, am, I, am I understanding the question right there? I think so. Yes. Um, Corolla. Yeah, there's many charities. We're one part. Just back, just back on again. Just back on again. Oh, actually, Carola Bell, who asked the question, is now back with us. So if she has it, oh. Carola, if you have anything you want to add to that. Unmuted. Carola? Hello, yes. I, I, it's the question where you have perhaps a lot of charitable purposes and not all of them you then feel are so relevant. Whether if you fund under the ones that are more relevant, you can then have complaints that because you're not funding under another one. Well, I, I suppose that, that you know that, that that may be a consideration locally, and I think that really goes back to the question. About one of the dangers, I suppose, of um, obtaining charitable purposes in your governing document that in fact you're you're never um, you know carrying out any activities in furtherance of those those purposes, then you do leave yourself open potentially to criticisms from uh, members of the local community, for example, that, that you're, you know, you're, you're not um, providing public benefit in, in their interests. So I think um, you know, in the longer term, if you, if you felt you had purposes that were no longer relevant um, or, um, or, or in fact had never been relevant, then um, you, you know, it may be that actually applying to, to us for consent to remove those purposes would, would be advisable. But, but certainly in the shorter term, you know, particularly where, you know, a charity has to make, you know, tr trustees have to make sort of rationing decisions about how most effectively to use the resources um, at their disposal, then there is certainly no expectation in, in charity law or, or on our part that, um, you know, you, you're pursuing all of your purposes all of the, all of the time. Um, and it, it would then really be up to the trustees to... Um, to, to make full use of their trustees' annual report as part of their accounts to, to explain uh, the, you know, the, the, the sort of range and diversity of activities they're pursuing and if they have some purposes where, in, where in, in effect, they've, they've, um, you know, they, they've been inactive during the, uh, the accounting period, then to, to use that report as, as, a, as a means of ex explaining why. Yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of charities who, let's just say, they had two purposes will spend 95% of the time doing one of the purposes and only 5% of the other. There's, there's no expectation that they should all be sort of divided up equally, you know, and unless, you know, they, you mentioned maybe people complaining, then there's not really grounds for complaint unless you've gone out there and said, we will give, you know, 50% to this and 50% to that, you know. So it's not uncommon for charities to place, you know, a greater emphasis on one purpose than the other. The, the only um, sort of qualifying note I'd perhaps add to that of course is where the charity has restricted funds where, where a charity um, where, where funds are, um, are, are you know, subject to special trusts where they're being held specifically for one purpose then um, you know, clear, clearly uh, those funds are ring fenced for that, that purpose and can't be used for other charitable purposes or, or, or you know, sort of for the general running costs of the organization thank you Stephen it's I don't think you'd want to add to that. Oh, I don't know if Stephen's still there. We lost him. Is he away? Um, just check to see whether he's still on the list. Um, Ailey, do you want to pick up... Oh, no, he's still on the list. Um, Stephen, I don't know if he can hear us. I think Stephen... No, possibly not. Ailey... Ted, got you. 
Um, shall we just go on to the next question, Ailey, um, for Kenny and Steve to answer and see if we can pick Stephen up again? The last question so far is, could a charity provide grant funding to a public sector organisation to support a regeneration project in a specific area for interest, and then brackets, if it supported the charitable purpose? Um, hmm. If uh, there are, there is certainly, I think, scope for charities that have regeneration purposes to um, enter into sort of collaborative arrangements, partnerships with public sector bodies, or, or indeed, for that matter, private sector bodies, where perhaps they are they are sort of jointly investing in projects. That um, you know that, that further their wider regeneration purposes. Um, so uh, you know it's not it's not perhaps that uncommon for uh, charities with regeneration or community development purposes to take part in kind of partnerships with with um, with, with public sector bodies where there is a, a, a shared aim there. And and clearly things like local authorities, for example, have many funds that are available for. Um, expenditure on um, sort of community development type activities, which uh, you know are, are, are charitable activities, and and which you know if if you know, if if that activity was being carried out by a charity would would, would be perfectly um uh, perfectly perfectly acceptable. Um, I, I think this is this is a case I think where we would need a lot more context really before we could um, you know pass too much comment upon the, the the specific example yeah it's it's again it's it's not a definite no we have had circumstances when charities have been winding up where where some of their assets have gone to for example a local authority but only on the condition that you know was something in writing for example from the local authority that it was an assurance that it could only be used for a charitable purpose. Okay, thank you. Have we got Stephen Phillips back? No, I don't. No. Okay, we'll find out what's happened there. Um, do we have any more questions, Ailey, or does anyone want to raise their hand and ask a question of Stephen Kenny? That's all the questions from the question box. Okay. Um, do any of the participants want to ask a question directly? There is no raising of hands. Okay, fine. All right, well, I think it perhaps just be useful to have a, a very quick summary then. I've made a few notes, but Rory, I don't know if you want to say um, a couple of words and then go on to Stephen Kenny, and then I can um, just round up um, and with details of follow-up, etc. Um, so, Rory, is there anything you'd like to pick up? Well, I think it's been very useful. We did a workshop like this at a conference and similar idea. A lot of it will be grey areas and uh, you know, the, the phrase about it, uh, the, you know, it's up to the trustees at the end of the day that it's, a lot of these will be subjective decisions and I think there's been a good discussion and people have a much better idea as to the basis they can make these more subjective decisions but at the end of the day, you know, it's their responsibility and uh, you would hope that people wouldn't Play it either too safe or too adventurous when it came to these decisions, but I think it's been a useful exchange. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Um, Steve, Kenny, anything to finish off with? I, I think um, just to say, um, you know, we're, we're very pleased that we've had an opportunity to take part in this. I mean, I think one of the things Kenny and I were concerned about beforehand was that um, you, you know it might, it might get a bit repetitive from our point of view if you like in that you know we, we might either just find ourselves going to constantly saying no or, or, or you know, equally unhelpfully constantly saying well it depends yeah um, and, and I think um, you know if, if we, we, we do recognize that you know for particularly for bodies like development trust that, that you know have, have quite broad-ranging purposes that there is plenty of scope there for for inventiveness really and and, and sort of imagination and and uh, you know and we're, we're you know we're constantly um, um, uh, surprised and, and and delighted I think at, at the you know the kind of the range of different um, sort of imaginative projects that, that um, you know 
charities are coming up with and, and proposing it. And you know, and to some extent, the kind of pushing at the boundaries of what is charitable is 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 sort of part of the, the you know the kind of nature of the game, really. Um, and you know, it's what keeps Kenny and I in a job, frankly, because it's these kind of policy questions that um, you know that the the case officers are coming to us with, looking for for guidance. Um, we do also recognise, I think, that you know, when we, particularly when we're talking about things like community development, that there is a big difference between um, sort of small, fragile rural economies and um, uh, you know, what community development would mean in the middle of Dundee or Glasgow, for example. And uh, you know, the kind of, some of the kind of activities we're talk we've been talking around here today, like um, supporting small businesses, and community cafes and things like that take take on a different context and a different dimension when you're talking about rural economies from uh, you know the, a city centre. So um, I mean I hope I hope uh, it's been useful in terms of um, you know, the responses we've been able to give to you today. Um, and um, you, you know, just uh, you know, if, if if you if you come up with further questions, then as as I say, you know, with that caveat that we had at the outset, really, which is that you know, ultimately, um, Oscar should not be used as a substitute for sort of bespoke professional advice um, with people who have all of the context of what you're proposing. If you if you if you keep that in mind. But you know, at, at the same time, you know, we we are open to um, you know, sort of general requests for for sort of um, guidance um, you know, in, in terms of the um, the general duties of trustees and and the, the charity test. Great, thanks, Stephen Kenny. So I think just to sort of conclude, then, there's a, a few key points that I've taken out of this: is that the context of each case is is really important, um, and then when you're discussing things with the case officers at Oscar, um, to to provide as much information as possible, um, especially evidence of economic and social fragility. And the point that um, Steve was making then about the difference perhaps between rural and urban areas, and the fragility argument, particularly in some of the more remote um, rural areas, is key. Um, that the trustees, as they said right at the start, are at the heart of the decision-making process and they've got to demonstrate care and diligence in that decision-making process um, and there will always be a, a role for getting suitable professional advice, particularly on issues such as loan schemes um, and that professional advice exists. I think some of the um, other grant funders can assist with that. Um, so th there's a number of documents and um, areas of advice that have been referred to. The DTASS and um, traffic light guidance which which um, is included as a handout. There's also um, a reference that Stephen Kenny made to the Charity Commission HMRC guidance on tax um, and the work that High's done on investing in your communities, which is being refreshed at the moment. But we'll circulate links to all of those documents after this, together with a copy of the presentations. Um, and there'll also be a recording available if any colleagues want to listen to it going forward. So we'll circulate details um, of all of those. Um, Ailey and Katrina, is there anything else we need to pick up technically or anything else we, we said we would do? Uh, apart from, I think we've got Stephen back if he, would want, if he wants to summarise or say goodbye, if that's everything. I'll be circulating um, everything that you just said that you would. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Stephen, thanks, thanks for getting back in again. We've just had a quick sort of wrap up, um, Kenny and Steve and myself. So is there anything you would just like to say in conclusion? Uh, probably unsafe for me to do that because I probably overlap with what uh, <laughs> what has been said. And it seems, you know, I, I thought the questions that you know were interesting ones that they were probing absolutely um, for the most part the boundaries of of, of of what's possible. I think the conclusions in terms of the judgment call ultimately sitting with the charity trustees, but based on you know these important principles that have been kind of outlined and, and re-emphasised in the course of the the, the session. I think that, that that's probably the, the, the one kind of key thing to, to be taken away. Great. Okay, thanks everyone for taking part. Thanks to Stephen and Rory and Stephen Kenny, and particularly Stephen Kenny and Stephen for answering all the difficult questions. Um, do get in touch if there's anything um, that's arising out of the seminar that we can help with. Um, and I think we'll just all log off now. So thanks, folks.